I was very excited because uh, for once, uh, social issues became also a key generation of ideas, unlike uh, products we do for developers to sell. So the three ideas, we want housing and a park, connectivity to surroundings and multi-generational living. The first one, the site is next to the an old canal that has been slapped over to become a linear park. And that park connects to a green ecological corridor of low density housing. The master plan calls for high density housing surrounding this green corridor. So our site looks straight into this greenery. So one of the first ideas that I had was really to take greenery vertically uh, and then to let it rise above the car park block and onto sky terraces. Landscaping the ground plane <clears throat> and rethinking car parks rather than open car park lots. If we put them under the building in the podium, can we not stack them up vertically? Can we cascade them and, and make these units appear sitting on a, a hillock? So this is the uh, project built. Idea really was that uh, these car parks, of course, naturally ventilated, has deep overhangs of landscape terraces, connected by a labyrinth of stairs. So you could also uh, walk on the stairs on a nice day to your car park lots on every half level. Um, and the advantage of, of doing this is that the podium car park block now is integrated in landscape. And on the fourth story, we have a common uh, safe landscape park that connects to all the lift cores so families can come and socialize <clears throat> but if, if you look at the way the car park is set up there are vertical cuts of light well in between with cascading landscape and landscape grows wild and these intermediate light wells and ventilation light wells actually bring light and air and negates using lighting and also negates using me mechanical ventilation for car parks. Of course, we had to break a few uh, stereotypes. We had to work with our National Parks Board, who argued for a more manicured landscape. Um, we wanted a more wild landscape. And the town council, which is appointed, they appointed to look after these public facilities, had a, had a kind of idea that all uh, public housing should be painted in very vibrant colors. Um, but we, we managed to get our way to have a gray and black project because we know that the green would be a good contrast. Now on these sky amenities, the sky bridges or sky terraces, this was also partially needed for, for refuge areas, but we envisaged that they will be connected off the lift and they could be used now. You can see for yoga classes, for martial arts classes, etc. But what was really interesting about this project was the way we conceptualized this. We started the project because by then we we're quite familiar with our methodology of thinking about volume and space was to design around people and what they need. So Singapore faces an aging population <clears throat> and high standard of living and most young couples are dual income. So they could not afford helpers. <clears throat> so most of them will drive fairly far to drop off their kids before going to work. And grandparents or pa their parents look up the kid happily. And a lot of them do then drive all the way to pick the kids up and they end up eating together communally. So all this back and forth, you know, uh, there's a government uh, initiative to, to, to have already uh, kids live within a certain perimeter of their parents, because the idea would be that they will help to look after the elderly. Um, it's a very Confucianist kind of ethic. But here we went one more step further. We said if three generations could live together and stack them up, that would be great. But they need their own autonomy. And 
uh, on this slide, uh, we have elderly childcare centers, coffee shops, a place for funerals, a place for wedding, playground that integrates elderly and children, communal green garden and worship facilities. So everything that you saw in the previous uh, slide where the void deck was being used for multiple levels of program, now we try to sort to integrate them in the podium. So you see there uh, the wedding chapel, which also used for night screenings. And then that triangulated uh, area is a, a, a private area for funerals. So we've designed ramps for hers, big doors. So we play through the scenarios, the, the, a day in the life of uh, a typical dweller. What time did they wake up? Buses come to pick up the kids. When does Mr. Lim goes to work? Would, would he meet his neighbor? Do we create a main street with some coffee shops? Can the elderly exercise while the toddler is also exercising? So there's a lot of cross integration of amenities. We have uh, elderly exercise next to kids exercise. We have senior citizen center next to childcare center, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so the idea is to integrate. The main idea for this and the social idea is multi-generational living. Now you can see that being reflected by this diagram. The L-shaped diagram is the, the primary applicant of the flat. The green is the elderly studio that's especially equipped with emergency uh, buzzers, wheelchair friendliness. Even the kitchen is designed differently and they are stacked on top. And on top of that, they have a, a, a normal unit. So. Each stack clearly is expressed in the architecture. And if you are three generations, you can buy the stack. A typical Singapore uh, family is targeted for this group of people right now. And you can see the diagram here, standard family unit, an elderly studio, and a family unit. Now, there is an interconnecting stair in between that is connected by two sets of doors, very much like a hotel room connected double door. And the elderly couple gets to come in on their own landing, a sense of autonomy, but they can easily be looked after by their younger unit uh, children when they're older, and the, the kids can also leave their, their child. So it's, it's a way of uh, coming together that, that is custom built, and the architecture reflects that. The construction of the architecture reflects that as well, in the sense that these are precast units, and the precast units, by way of the way SCDA looks at program, expresses itself very well in the facade. So you can see the interlocking units and how it's constructed. Uh, we we re-engineered the windows as well to make sure that all the windows are slim, that they do not have subframes meaning a fixed frame and an inner frame, as it cuts on the amount of uh, glass areas, we have to actually change and break the mold of how public housing is done and the way it's constructed. And these components are transported and stacked. This is a plant, it's very compact. You can see the elderly unit in green, <clears throat> which is own entrance. And you can also see how the staircase can interconnect and how you can close up this particular unit. And it, it is practical because as the elderly gets older and as they pass away, the, the younger family grows and they can absorb the unit on top to be part of their unit as well. <clears throat> and this is the completed uh, building facade. We have chosen a gray mullion to match with the gray precast walls. And we have chosen uh, tinted glass so that the expression of unit comes through in the delineation of the white band from the pre-casting uh, exercise. The um, escape staircase is not enclosed. It's actually covered by expanded metal mesh. And there are lots of slots in between for cross ventilation. You can see here. And then these slots, while you remember that the older flats had the closed drying in the facade, we have folded it inwards. And instead of the bamboo poles, we have drying yards with stainless steel extensions. And 
because all the um, compressors are stacked up, it also helps to aid the drying of the clothing. So this is where a problem can become an amenity as well, if you think about it, and can be integrated clearly into the form of the building. In this project, we want to complete the loop, not just cultural sustainability and ideas of how people should live socially, but also environmentally as well. This particular project <clears throat> um, has a few ideas. We have rainwater collection areas on the roof, and this rainwater collection is meant for drip irrigation of the sky terraces. So it's collected on the multi-story car park on the terraces and through drip irrigation, waters the, the, the various terraces. On the ground, we have bioswales, so rainwater uh, runoffs are filtered naturally before it's released back into the system by retention basins all around. And on the roof, we have solar panels to run for now, only the public uh, areas like corridors and terraces. Um, we have solar panels, solar voltaic cells. And of course, uh, we also use non-toxic lead paints and, and other uh, environmental products. So this is a platinum award uh, kind of and uh, green globe platinum. And we have kept all the trees and incompetent landscape. So at the end of the day, you realize that you can have a nuclear of 680 families living in a very small space, incorporating a food court. The food court is just uh, 50 meters across the street on another project that's also designed by another Singapore firm, Woha. So these two companies really looked at how social housing can be integrated. For me, I wanted to be true to what our thinking was about space, and I wanted to apply it here. And I think we have managed to do it quite successfully. And I'm happy to say that this project was 12 times oversubscribed. Yeah, so this is the argument for high density housing uh, that, that can embrace high quality space, that can embrace sustainable practices and also social cultural sustainability. And the last part of my talk, I just wanted to show something else beyond residential high density housing. Uh, other typologies we've been um, quite interested in looking at cultural institutional buildings. Obviously, the design processes is quite different here. Uh, the three projects I show very quickly is the National Design Center in Singapore, the Singapore Art Museum and the Founders Memorial. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in 2011, <clears throat> we had to retrofit or is adaptive reuse of, <clears throat> of uh, an old school. And actually three old buildings that span a period of several years post-war. You can see in this uh, picture, you have an Art Deco building, and then you have an earlier uh, colonial style building. And all of them are integrated into what is now the National Design Center. So it's to restore the building, but also to look at the idea of how a public building should be. And I think while we talk about uh, housing projects as being very program driven. An institutional project should do 
beyond what it serves its purpose for. In this case, the two projects I'm showing, actually it's in the new arts district. <clears throat> you can see that we looked at our project as a connector between the School of Art and the National Library. <clears throat> so we wanted to make sure that the concept of integrating these buildings is through two courtyards, a rear court and a central atrium. And we wanted this to be a thoroughfare where all the students can walk past when they go to the library. So from an urban design standpoint, it should be open 24 seven and should have amenities to support this. So the program would be to have a library, a design library, and then a, a open all day coffee shop to serve the clientele and the students. And beyond those doors, pivoting doors, we have uh, prototyping labs, 3D printers, laser cutters, that students can use on a per dime basis. So, and on top of this would be a small studios that design professionals can, can rent. And on that, we have also an auditorium and exhibition space. So this is the result. In the old school uh, yard, um, we refurbish it and put in a skylight other amenities like conference room and permanent exhibitions, we house them in a series of interlocking volumes that are clad in expanded metal mesh to become floating lanterns in this space. And on either side of the corridor, the, those offices are lined with light timber to give it some warmth. <clears throat> you can see the, the idea of the roof. The idea of the roof came about by a formal idea of folding and that idea is carried through to different parts of this design center. And then what you can see to the right of my screen, those big uh, panels, those are all pivoting doors that can open up to reveal these square modules that can be wheeled out for exhibition. You can see the pivoting doors, in this case, able to transform space and to change its usage. Within one of these volumes, you can see in silhouette, a new staircase that connects the conference rooms. To the right, <clears throat> you see the pivot doors. Behind these pivot doors are these square boxes that are on casters and you could wheel those clusters into the space and uh, their panels open to form various configurations for exhibition. And when not in use, the boxes go back and the pivots shut. Uh, on the second floor, there's an old uh, school chapel <clears throat> and um, we sought to at uh, audiovisual, fire suppressant, air conditioners to it, but we want to do it lightly. So we created a series of folded expanded mesh and all the mechanicals are just behind it. The audio and the sprinklers and the lighting all integrated. And you can see the folding of these ceiling also highlighted the, the gargoyles or the reliefs on the side. This is a view of the ceiling. And this is the view of the new stairs. So there's a very clear distinction between what's new and what's old. And in the rear court, we added a reflective pole. And even the fire escape staircase is lit. It's often used for dance performances um, and becomes a light beacon in this space. The second project was a competition we won three years ago which is the Singapore Art Museum in an international competition. And uh, this particular museum had been added onto in the early 90s in a more postmodern way. So we proposed to actually uh, remove that old addition and introduce a new program. Well, again, it's located in the art district. And 
because of space constraint, we we sought to uh, uh, add on to another property across the street at Old School, and needs to be linked by a bridge. So this was what it was uh, in the early 90s. You can see the gray block on your right had a postmodern addition, and we wanted to be authentic and to remove this. So removing it back to the way it was and rethink how contemporary art is displayed. What contemporary art needs is humidity, humidity controls. It needs high ceilings. It needs large spaces. So there's no way we can add a, 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 a thousand five hundred square meter gallery uninterrupted. <clears throat> so we propose a gross two thousand square meter box, <clears throat> um, column free, veranda truss, cantilever box to sit on top and to free up the ground plane to create a plaza. And then to connect our vertical core, another auditorium on the other side to fulfill the needs and connect them to a sky bridge. We also propose on an urban level to, to close off Queen Street to become a plaza and, and let that be the main entrance to the museum rather than coming in axially in the old building, we shifted the entrance and created a plaza. The subway stop incidentally feeds onto this plaza and we envisage this to be a catalyst or the node that will activate the arts district. Events Plaza. <clears throat> so the clear and old are clearly differentiated. <clears throat> The auditorium, all, all these are added as distinct volumes. So this is a shot of the atrium. <clears throat> uh, the walls are in situ concrete with uh, gray travertine, balsa, balsatina stone floors and restoring the old buildings and making sure there's transparency to look back at the dome structure, which is historic structure. Another view of the gallery. You'll see that in the ceiling, all the mechanicals are clearly hidden away. The ceiling is a black, uh, non directional hairline stainless steel, uh, in a way replicating the color of the gray balsatina. And along the way, too, circulation spots like staircase can double as study areas or lecture areas. We had to introduce a new stairs going up to the floating box. And we are leveraged on the existing structure to insert a, a meandering stair going up. And at the very top, you have this uh, open, big open space. And the glass that you see are 13 meter high pieces of uh, low iron glass. The structure of the glass is partially supported by a series of uh, tinted yellow glass that actually changes angle towards the dome. It's flat in the dome, but it starts to angle out on both sides. Idea for that was to deconstruct the image of the dome, uh, uh, the image as an art piece. So the different varying shifts of the reflective glass would reflect the dome in a deconstructed way, symbolizing the new addition to the historic building. <clears throat> so this is what it would look like. And depending on how you move, the image will change slightly. The last project I want to share is another approach to designing institutional building. It's a memorial. And this is an co international competition, which uh, we did not win. But nevertheless, I thought it was an interesting thing to show too. Uh, <clears throat> the Bay East Garden Marina Bay sought to have a museum to commemorate the history of the founding of Singapore. And one of the key considerations with the founding uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Lee, was that he shuns any kind of memorialization of his achievements. So <clears throat> um, we wanted to design, it's connected to a subway station, a memorial 
there is a legacy to his achievements. And we, we thought how, what would be a metaphor for us to start with. And obviously, this is a garden city. And one of the national trees that you see in Singapore is a rain tree. So we sought to look at the metaphor of rain tree, how we can use that form to generate this museum. And here are the three uh, founding principles um, of Singapore. And the metaphor we chose really was a rain tree, which shelters a space, and then to have low E large pieces of glass. So the quote we found, a society grows great when men plant trees whose shade in which they know they shall never sit. To always plan ahead and plan for the distant future. <clears throat> so this is our symbol. We want it to be both a memorial and a youthful museum. So in order to achieve that purity <clears throat> and for it to stand out against the other monuments in Singapore, I sought to create something very pure and very metaphorical and to cut into the lower level all the exhibits. So the exhibits will be housed in the lower level and the upper level. This is a close-up of how we envisage this museum. It will be an oasis. And when you first enter, you enter via ramp. <clears throat> this is actually level, ground level is not how you enter. You slope down to a ramp and then you eventually make your way up to the roof. So via ramp, you'll be coming down to uh, minus one. And this is where the permanent exhibitions are. And as you come and let down to B2. This is where you start to take a, a vernacular, sort of a, a lift, a lift that adjusts itself and hugs the curve of this building <clears throat> to take you to the roof. And I imagine that, <clears throat> that I should create a space <clears throat> that would create awe, that would evoke all the senses, the phenological, um, and a memorial should evoke feelings and should move the spirit. So depending on the light, very much inspired by the Pantheon <clears throat> on the big Oculus, hits the texture of the metallic wall, <clears throat> it will create a sense of awe and remembrance. <clears throat> There's a, <clears throat> a quiet reflecting pool in the middle. <clears throat> this is an inside that volume, that's part of the rain tree. And as you make your way up, <clears throat> the last bit is a ramp with exhibitions. And then once you complete the narrative of the history, you end up in the top, looking back at the new metropolis and the achievement of the founding fathers. So something that is very understated, that's not very direct, but has a clear narrative. That, that is actually my last, my last uh, project, but I just want to end by saying too, very quickly, <clears throat> that during this pandemic, we, we also sought to start SEDA Lab, and SEDA Lab uh, has collaborated now with an uh, environmental group called Palais for the Oceans from New York, and we are designing the Ocean Research Center. At the same time, SEDA Lab is embarked on their own project of creating off-grid self-sustainable units uh, that extends into the hospitality space. So these are container projects that we are building now in Bali that is totally funded by SCDA Lab that uses repurposed container that is totally off-grid. That shelter is a solar roof that can generate 12 hours of usage for air conditioning with a large porch. We have composting toilet and we have rainwater collection systems, and we are testing it now uh, as uh, a way for us to, to think how we can place this not-for-profit projects in different locations. And, and this is uh, Exponent Exxon. So all these different ideas are happening at the same time. And all I want to say is that depending on the type of buildings that you're doing, uh, there are different approaches to thinking of design. So with this, I'd like to uh, end my talk today. Thank you so much.